Hello, Roland Rockwood, and welcome to the Manila Museum virtual studio visit. I'm hey, Catherine. Hi. <laughs> welcome to my studio. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for inviting me and for allowing us to record. Um, we're looking very much forward to seeing you, seeing your, your pieces throughout your house. Um, would you go ahead and uh, give us a little brief introduction about yourself and your work and your practice? Sure. And so I'm an abstract expressionist artist. I uh, didn't always start that way. Um, back when I was younger, I was uh, actually drawing nudes. So I drew nude bodies out of magazines, wink, wink. <laughs> but um, so I was always fascinated by the human body and everything that had to do with the human body. And eventually, um, as I got into my teenage years, I was still drawing the human body, but then I got into graffiti. I did graffiti for about four years. So I was actually a graffiti artist as well as drawing the human body, the human figure. And, and where, the were time, you, where were you mm -hmm. doing your graffiti at? Uh, all over, in places I shouldn't be doing graffiti. <laughs> so everything from trains to walls, um, even a van. <laughs> <laughs> That's Oops. too bad. The band was in a good shape, so I was trying to pretty it up. <laughs> but that's how bad it was. I was pretty much bombing everywhere. Train stations, yards where the trains were at, and all those things. But during that time, um, even though I was doing graffiti, I was still drawing the human body. Um, I went to a school in New York, the National Academy of Design, mm -hmm. down by the Guggenheim Museum. So I went there for a short time, and what's good about that uh, those classes that I had there was Terrence Cole was my instructor and he's the instructor for the Art Student League um, is that we studied the bones and the muscles uh, throughout the whole body so that's something that I was really fascinated with and it uh, sort of intrigued me it was exercising my brain and it also started the whole analytical process of how I think about things and then eventually I went to the Navy after four years of traveling the world I got out and I decided to transition more to abstract painting. And so um, for me, uh, because of my studies in college, I ended up studying business. Um, I sort of leaned toward um, wanting to study things that were more analytical and thought processes, looking at things from a 2D, 3D, 4D way and trying to de decompose things, recompose things. <laughs> and, um, and that's how I, I it, eventually developed the language and the narrative of my art. But um, yeah, and then eventually sometime in, uh, I think my 30s, I went to the Heron School of uh, Design at mm -hmm. Indiana University, Purdue University, and I studied oil painting for a short time. So a lot of studies, a lot of continuing education. And what's so interesting too is um, if you've seen a lot of the artists in our collection too, that Art Student League National um, Academy of Academy Design, of they've Art. all studied there. So you're in this yeah. great lineup um, <laughs> of right. artists that, um, standing on the shoulders of, and I think that's wonderful yes. that you were able to do that. How, how, was, um, how was it for you? Well, it was good, it was good. Um, and, and the processes of getting into abstract painting, mm -hmm. um, for me, it wasn't so much about the narrative or the theme of my work as much as it was about putting together the composition of my work. So um, initially I was always painting on wooden frames and I would create and build these wooden frames. Then it got to the point where these wooden frames or as you can see, one of my paintings in the background, Lex Aterna is like a six foot by six and a half foot painting. So, um, so I have many paintings that are built out of wood. I use metal in my work. Uh, lately, I've been using some fabric in my work, LED lighting, uh, definitely use acrylic and oil, oil after the acrylic dries, um, uh, just so many different materials, whatever I can get my hands on. Mm -hmm. But I try to keep, um, uh, how should I say, in mind with the school of thought of ab abstract expressionism. Right. I don't want to ruin it for the, you know, <laughs> that type of um, genre. Sure, sure. So very much about the tactility, um, sort of uh, an assemblage, even those early yes. assemblages by Rauschenberg. Um, yes, Rauschenberg, Motherwell, a mm -hmm. lot of those guys. All the big I, abexers, yes. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And I follow some contemporaries as well. 
I mean, many contemporaries, Julian Schnabel, Jenny Seville. You know, Jenny Seville had this quote. She's talked about the pathology in her painting, how she likes to put down something that's ugly and make it desirable. I found that very interesting, that quote by Jenny Seville. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is really interesting. Yeah. Is that how you start, start to approach your own work or is that maybe one of the outcomes that ends up happening? That's a good question. Uh, both ways, actually. Sometimes it's a title that I want to work with. And um, I have actually a list of titles, probably about 30 titles and no work completed for the titles. Sometimes I'll just go through my titles and pick a title depending on what mood I'm in. And I'll actually create a painting out of that. Sometimes it would be a type of metal that I have, material that I have, that I'll just organize a whole painting project around that. So it just depends what medium, where I'm at, where I'm at in my life, you know, what I want to do and what materials I have available, what paint I have left uh, for me to actually organize it and construct what I want to construct. And then during the process, um, you know, you have some automatic painting in there, like my predecessors when they were doing automatic painting, uh, even um, uh, uh, Pollock when he was doing mm -hmm. automatic. So you have some of that, but me being me, the analytical person, I always draw to grab some of that paint and construct something out of it. Even if there's a narrative or even if there's some sort of um, cryptic information in there that only me and uh, maybe someone I would share it with. Right. <laughs> so it's not necessarily a narrative that the viewer is meant to know, but that still may technically be present um, or just that exactly. emotional feeling, that expression. Exactly. And they may pick off the, the type of painting that it is from the, uh, the name, the title of the painting, or it may be something really obvious in the painting that I'll just make one little, I don't know, part of the painting relevant to some part of the title and they'll eventually put it together and then start to develop their own language and what they're that, looking at. That's, I enjoy that so much about art is uh, putting together those pieces to have that conversation, to do the research and work on your own, not necessarily having someone tell you everything that's in it and what everything means, but to follow the clues. Exactly, exactly. And I certainly allow the viewer to experience it more than anything else. I, one of the materials that I use in my work is um, Mylar. Mylar is a reflective, they use it with NASA and balloons, uh, but Mylar is where you can actually literally stand in front of it and see your reflection. So I allow the viewer to actually participate in the art itself. And they, may be, they may be moved by something in the art or just by looking at their reflection, start to have some introspection about things going on in their life. They're actually in there. Is there, we were talking about too um, the other day, the process that you use to create your artwork, the layering, um, working with all of the materials that you do and, and then adding on oils as um, this sort of depth that comes into it, it, I thought was really beautiful and using even the mylar as um, a way to spread light, a way to disperse light too. Right, and that's the LED lighting that you're talking about, yeah. Okay. And it's, it's almost like the LED lighting, um, yeah, and I have polycarbonate in front of the LED lighting, so it disperses the light, so it's more of a glow of light going down the painting. So it's, it's hard to show here on video, you, it'd be hard to capture it, Right. but if it was hanging in a gallery by an outlet, I can actually plug in, you can see a light flowing up and down within the painting, like a little sliver of light. So I find those things um, fun to do. Oh, exactly. I should show you this. Yes, please. This is one of the works I did when I was 20 years old. Oh, wow. So when I talk about anatomy, when I studied um, at the National Academy of Design, I was drawing things like this. And that's a man on top of a woman is what that is. But uh, I thought I'd share that. I almost forgot Very about cool. that. But uh, yeah, love material though. Love material. Material. So you've really... Um, you you practiced and you studied the whole the whole gambit of of art and you're constantly evolving, learning new methods, learning new techniques, um, like like a lot of really interested artists do and um, continue on. I thought what was interesting about your titles um, that you have the notebook of them, the ideas. Um, a lot of of course the abstract expressionists also inspired by poetry, philosophy. Um, literature, 
all wrapped in there as well. Would you say that that would be an inspiration for yourself? It is, and also very hard to discuss because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a philosopher. But the thing is, um, yeah, truly, but the thing is, uh, there's a lot of meaning to that in my work. Um, and we could talk about mental illness at any point that you want to. But, um, you know, over the years, I've always struggled somewhere or another to try to figure out the, the, the best way to have an artist statement. And over the years, it just kept falling in place with the titles of my work, the type of work I was doing. What was really falling in place and aligning up is that I was actually painting really from a cathartic approach things about myself. I was working through things. So in a lot of my work, I always talk about, you know, aligning up, going in, finding the answers within it yourself. And, and then that sort of divinity, you see that in one of my paintings and talking about divine and spirituality and things of that nature. So I sort of lean both ways into uh, spirituality, self perseverance and things of that nature when I paint. I'm always oh. mindful of that. Beautiful. With with that in mind too, would you um, tell us about uh, some of the work behind you, and then sure. uh, walk us through your your home as well? Sure. What I can do is uh, I'm gonna go ahead and grab this. Just bear with me while I toss this camera around. But okay. I'll show you some of my work. Show you what I've been doing. Thank you. So this is Lexa Turner, and I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna give you a little close up. You can see my all my painting materials that I have here. <laughs> But um, this is this is Lexa Turner. It has to do a lot with acceptance. I created this when I was 50 years old. And um, what you see here is two wooden panels, a diptych, and there's fabric in the in the wooden panel there. There's metal coming down. There's mylar strips. We can see a reflection of yourself there. Um, a lot of different mediums, acrylic oil. And right here, if I can manage to do this. Um, I gotta figure out where the camera's at. There's sort of a skull here. Okay. There's a, there's a skull there, and then it's got um, the neckline right here, the spine, and then it's got an eye right there. That eye, can you see where I'm pointing? Yes, I can. That eye, yeah, that eye, and then there's teeth. So this is a skull, but the eye is actually looking back into the painting. So it says Eterna here, E-T, and there's an E here, R-N-A. And it's looking back into the painting, and by the way, there's a little screaming mouth there. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a screaming mouth there because at the time I was painting this painting, Hurricane Michael was hitting Orlando, Florida. So, oh, wow. so it sort of influenced my painting, the screaming and all this going on, the howling. But in talking about acceptance with this painting, hopefully I got this uh, put on right. Um, you know, I talk about going within to find yourself um, without. And I even have x-ray film here. That whole piece there is x-ray film. And I also included a photo of a goat um, jumping off a mountain. Can you see that? Yep. And so I, I put 50 on there. I tacked it with 18 a few years ago when I painted that. And that all has to do with taking the big leap. So the skull is looking back at the animal taking the big leap off the, um, the cliff there. And this is your big leap into um, pursuing art full time and really putting your, your whole into it, right? And that is true. It's, it's pursuing art full time, deciding, you know what, I'm just going to have to accept things the way they are and just um, <laughs> do art, you know, whether rich or poor, you know, is kind of what I came uh, to a decision to. This is one of my other new paintings. Oh. Right there. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, the gorgeous hussy. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna take you around. You want me to take you down the hall? Yep, that would be perfect. Okay. I'll take you down the hall into another room. This is one of my other paintings. So you still have the figure and the graffiti you still coming see through. The figure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's sort of a bipolar thing going on here. You can see the another arm. It's like another person there with another person, two people within there. That's called Rise of the Siberian Mammoth. And then I have these skull paintings here. And these self skull paintings have to do with man's search for meaning by Viktor Frankl, the book I was reading about um, his whole family being exterminated in Auschwitz. Okay. And so I created two paintings out of that. Um, and the name of the paintings are uh, Delusion of Reprieve because they felt that at the point they were going to be exterminated, that they still felt there was going to be hope. And I was inspired by that phrase. So I made two paintings by called Delusion of Reprieve. This is one of them. 
Uh, this is not the second one, but this is another painting I did. You can see the anatomy that I use in this painting. Mm -hmm. And um, and then this is Delusion of Reprieve 2. And that's the other one that has to do with uh, Auschwitz and the man's search meaning of life. Um, and so here we are into my dining room where I have other paintings. And I'll uh, show you some paintings here. You got Bamudi paintings. Um, one of these paintings right here, you probably recognize from the uh, Manilo. Oh yeah, we had that in our invitational, yeah. is that correct? That's, that is correct, that is correct. And this painting was based okay. off of Benedict Subaru back in the 1840s, who seen the Immaculate Conception and no one believed her. No one believed her, she believed in herself. And that's what I was inspired by. The fact that even though her parents didn't believe her, her priests didn't believe her, the church didn't believe her, uh, that she still felt that what she saw and what she believed in her soul is uh, what she saw, basically. And so in here, you see a priest. Uh, there's, there's a movie called The Song of Bernadette. Mm -hmm. And um, within the movie, there's a priest that has lines like this on his robe. So I actually included the lines of the priest's robe in there. And then you see there's a, there's a third one down here as well. How often do you work in series like these? Um, do, is it just as they come? Do you know, do you plan ahead how many are gonna be? Uh, it's it's literally one? just as they come. Um, mm -hmm. It's not often that I work in series. Um, it just depends what the theme is. Uh, with ben, uh, Benedict Subaru, with that series, there was just so much information based on what was actually going on, even with the movie, even with the actual script um, and the history of, of uh, Benedette Subaru. Actually, Benedette Subaru, right now, the place where she's seen the Immaculate Conception is actually, uh, there's a cathedral there. And there's 5 million people that visit it every year at the place where she's seen the Immaculate Conception, at least the vision of the Immaculate mm -hmm. Conception. So I would like to talk about your uh, analytical mind when it comes to your creative work as well and how you balance those two and how those are seen in your work because I, I think it's very interesting um, and it's a very fun way to look at the world to see both sides very often. Could you explain right. how that goes into your work and the multidimensionality? Sure, um, and there is a process, uh, usually when I'm putting material together or I have a theme that I'm working with, um, I start putting together, start working with the theme. Um, then as I'm actually laying the ground for it, actually painting or installing metal and pieces like that, I'm actually constantly thinking about the theme as I go along. Um, way into the beginning of, the, of actually creating a painting, I'm actually starting to take photos of my work during the process. So as I'm painting a painting and I'm concept conceptually creating things and moving composition, uh, where I want certain things to be, where I want uh, things to be highlighted. Um, I'm constantly taking photos of it. So as I paint, I take photos, I take a break in the evenings, I'm always reviewing the photos because in that is where I find the, the pluses and the minuses. That's where I find, oh, this can be embellished, this area right here. Or oh, it's too dark in this area. Oh, it's too light in that area. Or oh, the composition is just thrown off when the viewer have it. I mean, there are many times that I even turn off all the lights and then come in my room and, and look at the painting on a glance or with a flashlight, just to see how light hits it, just to see what's glimmering off of it, whether it's the metal, the LED lighting or whatever, just to make sure everything is right. So when people see the painting, they see it as, oh, it's a nice painting. It's all, you know, acrylic oil, it's got metal in it. But little do they know what all went into it. <laughs> it was a lot of photos. Um, uh, a lot of uh, expunction, taking paint away, trying to draw, uh, uh, draw attention to the bottom, the base of the painting, uh, leaving some painting on top, um, moving sometimes the composition. Uh, sometimes I, the way I paint, I do it by percentages. So I, I tell people, oh, I'm 20% in the painting, oh, I'm 30%. Sometimes I'll be 70, 75% into the painting. And then the next time someone sees me, how's that painting going along? And I have to tell them, oh, I'm back down to 55%. <laughs> That's only because I seen a flaw in the painting and I had to revamp a whole section. And sometimes with abstract painting, when you revamp in a whole section, 
you're going through layers of revamping. So then I have to build it back up and make it sort of a continuum with the rest of the, the palette. If that makes any sense. It does, it does. And there's a lot of revision that have if, that would have to go into a revision with there your is. piece, with all of the, the different layers um, built up. Um, one thing I, I wanted to ask you too, this program came about because of uh, our response to the COVID-19 pandemic and oh, wanting nice. to um, come into the artist studio to uh, bring something for you guys, to bring something to our audiences, um, to see the great work out there. So thank you so much for showing us around your studio. Um, how has your practice been affected by um, the recent changes in our world? And you know, right now we're in 2021, but we're it's it's still going. I know, and I can share with you a little bit about that. I can also talk to you a little bit about mental illness because I've been public about being bipolar too. I was diagnosed about seven years ago. So, um, you know, so some members of my family that haven't accepted it, they don't believe it. Some friends haven't, haven't accepted it. I've lost a couple of friends. I've gained the respect out of others, but it's all good. I'm bipolar too. That's what's good about me being an artist, I guess. It kind of helps my art. But with respect to COVID-19, it hasn't somewhat impacted me all too much because I'm really always in the studio, always working on things. Even when I'm not painting, I'm constantly looking up other artists, looking at their work and trying to see how I can elevate myself above what they've been doing. And one of the ways that I do that, especially during COVID, because I haven't had the opportunity to go out to the galleries, to museums, is by buying catalogs. So I buy a lot of catalogs from Phillips, Sotheby's, uh, Christie's, and I'm always flipping to the pages of abstract artists or even figurative paintings. I, I love it all. I love all the art. But I'm always trying to figure out how is it that they got to these places? <laughs> and I'm always trying to figure out how can I elevate myself, take myself up to the next level to be in, in that criteria. So um, during COVID, while I've had some downtime, I'm also doing a lot of research. So it can also be research not only into the catalogs, but research into the materials or research into new themes that I want to create or material that I have to buy, the raw material. So you've really been using your time to, to delve into your materials, into your work and um, that you brought up, um, and we've spoken about this before a couple of times, um, uh, just a mental illness and um, working through it through your work. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit and touch on how you use art and how it's been um, helpful for you? Yes, yeah, it's, it's been a savior. Um, and I, it took me a long time to realize that art was the thing always saving my life. Uh, anytime things went away, went bad, things weren't good, I always had the opportunity to eventually fall back on the art. Art made everything just better again. So um, it's been a part of my whole life. And I didn't realize it growing up in New York. I grew up in the 80s back when it was the uh, number one homicide uh, city in the world. I mean, I, how did I survive? I survived with art. You know, eventually I moved on to other things. But especially with COVID happening and with recessions, it was always art that saved my life. It runs in my family. Um, but, and I'll show you a painting here as well. This is another recent painting called uh, Quantum Decoherence. This is a painting that was at your museum as well. Yeah. And um, this painting is all acrylic oil. It's got polycarbonate, mylar reflective. And um, in speaking with mental illness, this painting I actually did when I was taking some medication that wasn't good for me and I ended up stuttering. And my family voluntarily took me to the hospital. So they took care of me, got me on the right medication. But the funniest thing about that is that this painting was hanging at the Manila Museum of American Art with me in the psych ward <laughs> during the time I was in the psych ward. But that's, uh, that's something that I like to uh, show people because I find that very interesting and, and a sort of timely at the same time. And I have another painting that you want me to show you another painting? Sure, please. Yes, so I got this is a little heavier painting. So this is a painting I have to ship out to uh, Talent, Oregon. That's where they had the big fires out there. So it hasn't got shipped out yet because we've been waiting for COVID to be done with. So I could then feel it's still safe to ship it out. It's going to someone who's a little bit older. 
So um, this painting is called The Third Voice. And this is pretty much sort of a self-portrait. This is like my, my whole head. And this is my skull over here. And this is like a, this is actually a torched piece of metal that got cut off of a Montgomery Ward tractor in Chicago. So I put it there in front of my face. And then you got this um, uh, ear that I put right here. There's a sort of this ear. So you got the skull here, the brain here. And you got this sort of transcendence thing going on here. Usually when I paint, you also feel this sort of Kundalini feeling, like this exhilaration of feeling when I paint. And I paint for hours and hours and hours. But then that's the third voice is right there. And that's like my locus of control. It's that place where that is that intuition that I tap into while I'm painting. And so, um, and that tends to drive the painting. So this is like my analytical side of my brain. And this is my creative side of the brain. And you can see it has a robot there, has some teeth falling out here. That's because sometimes I talk too much. <laughs> What's the title of this piece? This is called the third voice, the third, the third voice. voice. And that's that intuition, that, that intuition that directs me in my work. Wonderful. And I do have some other projects that I'm working on as well. Yeah, you are you, I absolutely do. What, what new yes. work are you working on? So th there are a couple of things that I'm working on. Um, one of the things is called, it's like a photo montage painting. And so that's what this is here. And what this is, it's multiple images taken and then another photo taken of the multiple images. Then I bring it onto the computer and I blend the multiple photos into one photo, print it out. And then I do a painting right on top of the whole photo. So it's a process to do this, but I find it very intriguing. This is a friend of mine. I happen to do it with one of her photos and uh, the rest of it is mostly all acrylic. Okay. So that's and one of the projects, huh? How did you decide to start working in, in that medium? That's a very good question. <laughs> I haven't thought about that yet. My brain just seems to, um, uh, when you're talking about assemblage earlier, you know, mm -hmm. when I see works of assemblage, whether photos, photos or acrylic paintings, oil paintings, I'm always thinking in that realm. Again, that's that two dimensional, three dimensional place. And so when I was thinking about photos and painting, I've always thought and liked the, co the, the combination of both of them as well. And, I can, and that leans into this as well. So I also create these um, small five by seven paintings and I install it and suspend it in this acrylic glass with my logo. And this is based off of the violin series because I started playing violin as a way uh -huh. to soothe my brain. And the, the sign right there. So this is like a violin series. It's painting, it's acrylic painting within the glass, acrylic glass. And then I have a set of those and then a set of these Vermouthi paintings that's similar to Vermouthi, the actual big painting that I have where you don't have to worry too much about the future, don't have to worry too much about the past, but be present in the moment. Is that what a lot of your work is, uh, is about, is about being really present in the moment, um, being in the space with the art, with the expression? It, it really is. And, but, you know, the funny thing about it is that as I'm present in the moment and I totally go Zen when I'm painting, I mean, a, a glass can drop and I'll probably jump five feet up in the air. But the funny thing about that is that um, there are times that when I'm painting that I have the TV on, the radio on, I have music playing, I got music in my ears. There's a lot of things going on. It's like a montage of things going on. But that's sort of my element the way I grew up in New York. So I was always able to concentrate. When I have a lot of things like that going on, I tend to zone in and focus on, on certain things in the painting. But there are times that there may be nothing. And I'm focusing on one little part of the painting for three to four hours just to make sure I get it right. So it's an ebb and flow as I you know, go through the process of painting. How often, I don't know if that answered your question. It did, it absolutely did. <laughs> okay. And I was just gonna um, follow up with it too, is, is sure. how, how long do you work on your pieces? Do you, um, you probably have to come and go on them since there's so many, there's so, such built up, so, so, so much buildup. Right, right, it's true. There's a lot of buildup in the paintings and where there's, I have to let things dry, things are glued, things are nailed, things are painted. Um, 
uh, things that may be dry that I take back off and then put more paint on. So there's a lot of different things that I do. Um, typically a 20 by 30 inch painting, I have it down to about, uh, it would take about three days to a week to accomplish one of those. And my big paintings that are like six foot by seven foot paintings, I have that down to two to three weeks if I'm just boom, boom, boom right on it. And I'm talking about an average of six to eight hours a day for two weeks. And I can knock out one of these large paintings. But that's full time actually doing it day and yeah. night. I wake up early in the morning, get my coffee going, and it could be seven in the morning. I'm starting to paint in my studio. I just love being in the studio. And that's a great practice to have. <laughs> it um, is. Uh, aside from painting, do you do anything else in your studio to be inspired? You have all of the TVs on, anything specific? Yeah. Music? Yeah. So, like I was saying earlier, sometimes it's a movie. Sometimes it's Discovery Channel. It depends what's on TV. Certain things I can't watch because then it becomes too distracting. Or it could be that NPR has something very interesting. Then I start tuning in on NPR and I have to, you know, stay focused on my painting. So certain things, this ebbs and flows. It depends what's flowing in my studio. Sometimes I may even take a break and go to the keyboard and hit a couple of sounds or grab my violin and play the violin for a little bit just to break up the monotony. But what's also very important about that is that when I take those breaks in between the, the, the five or six, eight hours of painting, sometimes 10 hours of painting, is that I get to reflect on the painting. I look back at the painting, take some photos, go sit down, flip it. I even sometimes turn the photo upside down and try to just be beat at it in so many different ways. So, um, so besides the music, the TV, my violin, a keyboard, and taking photos of my work, that's all what's happening in my studio at the same time. It's not too often that I can paint with somebody in my studio because there's just a lot going on. And then I get totally uh, tunnel vision and totally zen. And I, it's, it's almost very difficult. Maybe if I was coloring by paint numbers or something, that'd be fine. <laughs> but not when I'm deep, deep in the process of painting. Yeah, it sounds like it's something that's very personal for you, very involved, something very one-on-one -on -one that you don't want to be away from. And personal at times, you know, yeah, because- it, it, yeah. Oh, I was gonna say, it, it, yeah. you, you said it was personal. Um, and when I look at it and when I speak with you, it sounds a lot like um, um, working through, being able to work through uh, different ideas, um, different changes in your life. Uh, we saw uh, Lex Eterna uh, in the first room, and that was really about um, you know, the changes in your life as you're turning right. 50 and you're becoming a full-time artist. Um, right. uh, what about the, the piece behind you, Lex Davina? So Lex Davina is off to the side here, and I can mm -hmm. show you. Um, let me see, we're still connected, right? Okay. Yeah. So this is Lex Davina right here. And this has to do with sort of going outside of yourself, finding things greater than yourself. So this, let me just lay out the whole painting right here. This particular painting is all wood. It's a wood panel that, that I built. Um, it's got fabric in it, fabric that you can actually move, little things you can turn in here. Uh, it's got the mylar, so you can see reflection of yourself and get totally immersed in the painting. It's got a large piece of metal and it's got a sliver of LED lighting that's, that runs right through there. But in order to get beyond yourself and to step out in some divine way, you have to really get to know yourself and move in into yourself. And so I find it, I find it very interesting to incorporate uh, X-ray film. So I have an actual X-ray film. I'm not sure if I'm catching it right, but- um, I think uh, I can see some ribs. Yeah, and then you got the ribs there. Yeah, so that's something I do with material is I incorporate x-ray film, there's teeth here, and then there's the neck. And then I actually drew out the ribs and painted the ribs. And then there's like a squiggly little arm there. And then the, the actual um, x-ray comes all the way down into the sacral area. But of course I did my own design on the sacrum area down here. But this has a lot to do with going within yourself in order to see something greater than yourself, you have to move in. And so that's what Lex Davina has to do with. That's really beautiful. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm seeing 
with that figure there, it, it's almost um, like he or she, I, I would say it would be genderless, but um, it, it's almost instrumental even. It's, a, it's almost taking on some aspects of, of instruments in this space. And so if you're, you're equating maybe, or are you equating um, selfhood and music and coming within and, and listening to yourself? And, and that has to do with that painting too, because that painting, that's the queen of strides right here. And this painting had to do with music. It was, okay. uh, I was inspired by the violin on this, in this painting. Let me just move this painting over. But uh, the queen of strides, all her glory and her climax, a bit sexual, but um, it has to do with the violin, the, you know, how the crescendo of the violin, and that's the climax of the violin. And so what, what you actually have here is two big panels and you actually have four strings of the violin. You know, can, and then I put a little A, D, E, G, little symbols next to the lines that you can see there, or you may not see, but it's a little bit uh, difficult. And sometimes I'll put a little motifs within my painting, just oh. little interesting things that you may find in painting. I even did it in this painting. Are those orchids? Um, no, it's actually a, a flower bee. I don't know what oh. I was, why I was painting that sort of thing there, but um, maybe that's when you were in the uh, <laughs> Discovery Channel. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been Discovery Channel. It showed up in my painting, and that's the whole thing with painting is that I allow these things to show up in my painting. You know, I I let things happen in my painting. I let the mistakes happen in my painting. Um, the mistakes sometimes turn out to be a good thing. Sometimes it totally, that mistake totally changes the whole focus of the painting. I try to keep to the theme, but I allow myself to explore what's happening. Mm -hmm. So I, I never get discouraged painting. Oh, well, sometimes I do, but <laughs> then I have to- Well, how do you move past that? How do you move past that? That's a good question. Yeah. That's a good question. So I take a break from painting. I, I, I just stop painting. I cannot, if I'm down, you know, sometimes bipolar brings you down depression. It's very difficult to paint when I'm down in that space. But what's very interesting about that, that's when I start developing all these reserves. And then when I start going up on the bipolar, start feeling better about myself, that's when that, all the paintings start coming out and I start exploding out. But um, I move through it very slowly and methodically. Um, if I'm struggling with a section of painting or maybe depression or whatever, man, have you, um, I actually take my time. So I may work in a small space, but not take on the whole painting. I'll just focus on the small space. Because once I start focusing on the whole painting and, and when I'm in that sort of mood, it, it, it starts to change the painting and, and it's not consistent with the theme. So I, I paint small or I don't paint at all. But when I'm feeling better, when I have those windows of opportunity, that's when I start laying down that brush and the paint. That's awesome. So you're able to to work with yourself and to work with to your strengths, to know where they are, to know that, okay, this is a period for, for rest, to look back and to see what I'm doing. So then to see where I'm going ahead in the next phase. You, you hit it right on the nose. You hit it right on the nose. And you have to be sort of, um, you have to have a lot of introspection to be able to do that. You have to really know yourself and know where you're on the painting because if you don't recognize it and you keep painting, you can destroy the whole painting and paint something that's totally off-centered of what you know the 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 whole goal was. But um, so yes, you have to be in tuned in order to get ready to put that paintbrush down again, because time is money, right? All this costs money. <laughs> the paint, you know, right. that's the worst thing to do is for artists to waste the paint, you know. So it's a, a lot of different type of materials, mediums going to it some that's hard to find. And sometimes I, I can't replicate a painting because the type of metal I use just doesn't exist anymore. That, that's really interesting too. I was wondering how, um, how do you get your, your, the found objects that you work into the pieces? <laughs> you, you have the work from Chicago and yes. of course, the Mylar, but um, you know, those, those historic pieces, they, they have some, yeah. some depth. How do you find those? Yes, and I, you know, it's luck, really. <laughs> you know, I have to be lucky. Orlando's very difficult. It's a, it's a beautiful, clean city. It, you don't find metal, shards of metal lying around the roads anywhere. 
But I always found it interesting to run across, you know, different pieces of crumpled up metal, um, just different materials like that. But Orlando is very hard. So I spent some of my time going into the scrapyards. And sometimes, depending on what I'm wearing, sometimes I'm dressed up, going in a scrapyard, flipping around through metal. So um, that's what I've been doing lately is going to start certain scrapyards that I go to and I buy metal from them. Um, but um, yeah, I'm always looking out for the next crumbled up metal <laughs> that I can make a piece out of. <laughs> always, always searching for the next, the next work. That's beautiful. <laughs> the, the next big thing, because, you know, metal, you know, it, it degrades, it changes in color, um, it rusts. And that to me reminds me of the human body, you know, as we go through life, you know, we have these tribulations, these obstacles that we go through. And you know, we just take on more and more and it changes us in so many ways. And that for me is like the materials of the work. Sometimes over time, like the metal, it changes and discolor, discolor, discolors <laughs> and, um, uh, and may even rust over time, just as we get old. So it, it, it has a life of its own. The it has a life of its own, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, I think exactly. that's amazing, and and I really respect and thank you for sh for sharing your work with us, uh, for your experiences. Thank you for being so open with your experiences with mental illness as well. I think that's um, something that's very important for us to speak about and to be open about. So, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I very much appreciate it. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs>